Hello everyone, hope you're having a good Thursday. Today we're going to look at uh, comparative primate anatomy. So essentially, uh, last week we talked about behavior, and so this week we're connecting that behavior to um, anatomy and seeing how morphological uh, changes in their anatomy, in primate anatomy, is adapted to behavior. So first, uh, we're going to define four major primate diets and uh, the adaptations is, that correspond to them. Uh, then we're going to define the major types of primate locomotion, identify male and female uh, primate uh, specimens and sexual dimorphism, what makes them different, identify social organization of a primate group and based on the degree of sexual dimorphism. So we're going to talk about why some um, primates are more sexually dimorphic than others. And so get to that last so uh, really quick to a little house cleaning uh, I there will be videos included in the PowerPoint um, but uh, I will not be showing them because of copyright issues in my uh, my lecture so uh, please look at them view them on your own time because they are interesting and they'll show you um, examples of behavior that I think are important to uh, visualize Okay, so some anatomical traits are better suited for specific environments. So this is an example of natural selection, which, you know, we talked about in the first week of class. So, um, and we'll go into that a little bit more, especially when it comes to diet. Um, so biological anthropologists, we identify anatomical adaptations that correspond to these primate behaviors. These patterns help uh, interpret the fossil record, okay? So this is going to be more important for next week when we talk about the human lineage. Um, and this is how we are, are able to identify our human, uh, early human ancestors and what makes them our ancestors and what makes them human, okay? So um, here's an example of uh, anatomy and behavior. So here we have... A graph showing different types of teeth and how they're and what they're adapted to. So here we have a graph uh, showing that down here we have a folivore. You can see how um, sharp is their molars are. So this is to create a grinding surface. And so we see that um, between these uh, gorillas, two different gorillas here, we got an unworn, then we got a moderately worn. So you can see how um, these teeth are designed for shredding and they wear down over time because they're dealing with fibrous uh, foliage. And then here we have an intermediate one. So you can see that the bicuspids are sharp, um, but not as sharp as these down here for, uh, or not as pronounced as these down here for grinding. And then these are the uh, frugivores and because they don't need to grind as much because fruit is soft, they're a lot less, um, they're more rounded, shall we say, than like the folivores down here. So body size is another morphological difference that we can see uh, based on diet. So it uh, correlates with dietary regimen and uh, folivores are the largest and insectivores are the smallest. And it has to do with the type of energy needed. So uh, large animals need a lot of energy to digest their food and so they need to be bigger. But uh, insectivores, because they eat insects and frugivores, um, insectivores especially, the uh, insects have a lot of energy in them, so they don't need to eat a lot and they don't need to be big to be able to gain that energy. Um, same thing with frugivores, they don't need uh, to be as big. Okay, so like I said, uh, some foods provide small bursts of energy and others provide slow burning energy. So that's the difference in body size. Slow burning energy, you need to be bigger to be able to digest it longer. And some foods are more difficult to process. And so that's why, um, as we can we'll see later, some uh, folivores have a lot more muscle attachments to them. And primates with different diets often have different tooth forms and digestive tracts. And we'll get into that a little bit more um, when we talk about each of the different uh, diets. And primates eat a wide range of foods but tend to emphasize some over others, okay? So, like, chimps... Uh, eat pretty much anything, uh, including uh, monkeys uh, and other uh, meat sources, but they uh, primarily rely on fruit. 
Um, and they do eat insects too, right? So we saw last week how they were fishing for termites. So that's a source of protein for them. Okay, so let me... So now we're going to look at insectivores. Insects are high protein and small packets of qu uh, quick energy. So this means they're small body primates. And examples of these, um, uh, so large body primates would need to eat massive quantities of insects to sustain their body mass. So uh, insectivores don't need to eat a lot of insects because they're so small. Um, so they need to pierce and crush the insect carabus so they have molars with pointy cusp. Um, Insects are easy to digest, so they have a very simple and short uh, intestinal tract. Here are some examples. We have loris, pygmy marmoset, and tarsier. And you can see how they have sharp cuspids on here where you have their teeth. So next we have good old gummivores. So gummivores um, eat tree gums and saps so these are also small packets of quick energy and they supplement with insects for additional protein but they mostly live off of uh, uh, gums and so here we see uh, they're very small body and their teeth adaptations they have uh, they need to scrape through the bark so this is where that dental comb comes in right that lemurs use so we can see here the dental comb and how uh, here we have this uh, marmoset who, uh, and you can see in this picture, oh, you can see in this picture down here how they're um, getting the gum and they'll, they lick it, right? So there's a video of that here for you to watch um, and see how they eat this uh, gum. So they also have a very short uh, and simple digestive tract because they don't need to uh, digest a lot. They don't need to break down insects because they're very small uh, and compact packages. Oh, and same thing with gum, right? It's sticky. It's already uh, almost a syrup, so they don't need to break it down anymore. It already is. Okay, so frugivores. Next, so fruits, they provide an intermediate amount of energy, and these are medium-sized uh, primates, right? They can be bigger, like uh, orangutans, but orangutans still aren't as big as, like, a gorilla, and they have tooth adaptations. Their tooth adaptations are for biting and crushing. So they have wide, large, uh, shovel-like incisors, molars with low rounded cusps, and these are smaller than uh, fulivor molars, okay? As we saw in that first slide. Their digestive tract is, um, because fruit is easy to digest, they have simple digestive tracts with a long or small intestine, right? So they don't need to, um, uh, they don't need to get rid of the uh, or digest the uh, very complex fibrous uh, leaves. So here we have the low rounded uh, molar cusps and showing the broad incisors, right? And so here we have the shovel shaped incisor down here and an orangutan eating uh, bananas. So folivores. Um, Eat leaves, which is a limited, slow-burning energy. These are the largest bodied primates. Um, they're t they have crushing and grinding teeth, and so they have lots of chewing, right? And so that means that they have a lot of muscles. Okay, so small incisors, and they have small incisors and large molars, and molars with shearing crests, like we saw earlier, for shredding teeth, right? So here's an example of that here. Okay, they don't need as big incisors. And... Um, Cranial adaptations that are involved in this is one of the only, um, this is the only diet type where we can see cranial adaptations. And so because it involves a lot of chewing, they have large jaw, large jaw muscles that have uh, attached to what's known as the sagittal crest. So here we see sagittal crest up here, and you can see how muscled the gorilla is and how it all, he has a giant head, right? Because all these muscles attach to it. And so these muscles allow for much pow more powerful jaws so they can constantly chew while they're eating their leaves. And so because leaves are fibrous, they have a very co elongated and complex uh, digestive tract. And so with this, we can see uh, a comparison of humans and um, chimp, uh, gorillas. So we see that gorillas have much, much larger muscles for chewing than we do. 
So that shows that we are not only leaf eaters, right? <laughs> we eat all sorts of diet, right? So we're on true sense of the word, we're omnivores. Um, so for locomotion now, uh, we're, first we're going to talk about vertical, vertical cleaning and leaping. And so what's known as, also known as VCL, the body is oriented vertically. Um, so movement occurs by leaping tree to tree. So they go from tree to tree like it. And um, there's a video there for your uh, viewing needs. And so the adaptations to this are um, very long legs relative to arms, long curve grasping fingers and toes, and they have a long feet and large ankle bones. So here we see um, a lemur here that's getting ready to leap and you can see it's vertical. So it's gonna hop from here to the next tree, just going forward, right? Like you're hopping along. And so um, the next form of locomotion is brachiation and suspensory. So shown by the gibbon here, we saw uh, gibbons last week, right? And how they locomote. And so the, the hainers suspend from tree branches and arm over arm. So this brachiation is arm over arm swinging. Um, so they are able to swing through the trees, right? And so um, the adaptations to this are lawn arms relative to legs, mobile shoulder joints. So that's why we can do this, right? Mobile, because we used to be brachiators. And um, the scapula is positioned on the back of the rib cage, and they have long curved fingers and no tail. And so we also have, like I said, mobile shoulder, shoulder joints and scapula position on the back. So these are homologous traits, so which shows that um, one of our uh, more recent ancestors was a brachiator. Okay. I'm, I'm so, I apologize for moving uh, this around all the time. So next is suspensory uh, semi-brachiation. Semi-brachiation um, uses arms and a prehensile tail, right? So they're um, long arm, they have long arms relative to legs and mobile shoulder joints and scapular position on the back of the rib cage and long curved fingers. The only thing that's different between semi-brachiators and brachiators is that the uh, semi-brachiation has a prehensile tail as we see with the spider monkey, right? He's hanging using his tail only. So this uh, allows for grasping ability of tree limbs so they can uh, suspend themselves using their tail also. So it doesn't involve over uh, arm over arm swinging, but it involves a lot of hanging from the trees. And this is only found in New World monkeys. Okay. So next is quadrupedalism, uh, which is forelimb walking, okay? And so first we'll go into arboreal quadrupedalism. So they walk and run uh, among tree branches and the slightly longer legs compared to forelimbs and the scapula is oriented to the right, okay? So it'd be like if we scrunched up like this. If you go grab your uh, dog, you can see that um, they're Shoulders are on the side of their body and not in the back like us. So you can do a comparison, right? Um, they also have prehensile grasping hands and feet with longer fingers, a lawn tail for balance. Okay, but the tail isn't is usually not prehensile. So we see a comparison there's a, between uh, other mammals. So a squirrel and squirrel monkey have very similar morphology. You can see that the um, scapula on both is to the side and not on the back like we have. So the other type of uh, uh, quadrupedalism is terrestrial. And here we have a mandrill, right? We talked about him last week. And so this means they um, locomote on the ground and the legs and arms are a similar length because they don't need to be in the trees as much, okay? So the scapulas are also on to the side and they have shorter fingers because they don't need to grasp and uh, they don't, don't need tails for balance, so it's much shorter. And here we have a comparison between a baboon and bear, and you can see how similar the um, their skeletal structure is, right? So this is analogous, not homologous. Well, also homologous, but mostly analogous because they're adapted to the similar environments. They're both terrestrial. So 
Next we have, um, let me try. Oh. oh, that's what it is. Okay. Next we have knuckle walking. Okay. So that's the next one. So this is uh, primates walk on all fours, but the weight of the upper body is supported on the knuckles. Okay. So let's see if I can show you. So essentially, they walk like this, okay? So they move forward on their knuckles. And we can do it to a certain extent, but our knuckles aren't nearly robust enough, unless you're doing something like boxing every day, right? So their knuckles are huge, um, and they're able to support themselves by walking on it. So they have adaptations for radiation, but they spend most of their time on the ground. So they can break in and move their shoulder joints, but they mostly knuckle lock. So they have long arms relative to legs, mobile shoulder joints, the same thing that uh, brachiators have, right? There's a video of a gorilla knuckle walking there. Okay, so now we're done with um, talking about locomotion. Now we're going to talk about, uh, oh, and so in a couple weeks we're going to be talking about bipedalism. And so that's what we do, right? And there's different types of bipedalism. And we'll go into that in a little further detail. So now we're going to get into social organization. And you have a couple different types. First, let me just move that over here. I think this will work. Okay. First is solitary. Uh, adults spend most of their time alone. And uh, adult uh, females spend most of their time with their offspring collecting uh, resources. Adult male occupies a territory that overlaps with several females. So this is a, an orangutan uh, social organization. Uh, orangutans are an example of this type of social organization, right? The males are solitary and they go off, do their own thing, and then, you know, they'll find a female and then do their thing and they'll find another female until so it all, all overlaps. But no male territories overlap with each other. So also it's monogamous, so these are gibbons, right? They're uh, one adult male, one adult female, and they're offspring and they live together, okay? So you can see how it breaks apart here. Uh, polyandrous is one adult female and multiple adult males, and their offspring all live together. So this is that tamarind, right? So this is one female, multiple males. So next we have uh, polygynous. And so there's different types. First you have up here, um, so this is multiple adult females for each male. First you have single male polygyny, so there's one male, multiple females. Then you have multiple male polygyny, which is multiple adult males, multiple adult females, and offspring live together. So single male polygyny would be like gorillas, right? There's one um, dominant male with a lot of females. Multiple male polygyny, an example is chimpanzees, right? So they have large social groups and they, uh, and there's multiple males and multiple females in these groups. They're very social animals. Um, so we also have another type, which is bachelors. So these are all male social groups and they roam around trying to usurp uh, uh, um, usually a um, male, um, a polygynous, one male multiple female groups so they'll try to replace the dominant in in that group okay and so these guys roam around and we saw that um if you watch the gelato video last week oh no i don't think i included that but if you watch some of the videos last week they have examples of uh bachelor groups okay so now We'll talk about why that's important. So it's important because of sexual dimorphism here, right? So here we see an example of relatively high sexual dimorphism in orangutans and low sexual dimorphism in gibbons. So as you know, it's the physical difference between male and females. And so uh, large traits are, are selectively favored because of sexual selection. Okay. So... 
degrees of sexual dimorphism relates to degrees of male-to-male -male competition. So the more sexually dimorphic a species is, the more male-to-male -male competition there is. Okay. Monogamous male, uh, monogamous social groups like the gibbons uh, have low male-to-male -male competition, so the sexual dimorphism is very low. Sometimes it's only just a coloration difference. Uh, single male polygynous groups and solitary groups have high male to male competition, so sexual dimorphism is high. Okay, so that's why gorillas, uh, what, um, gray, uh, silverback gorillas, right? They have silver on their backs, they're very big and um, compared to females. And same theme with those orangutans, right? So we talked about the flanges. Only dominant males have those flanges, so that's what differentiates them between females and adolescents. Um, and multiple male polygynous groups have relatively high male uh, to male competition, so uh, sexual dimorphism is pronounced, but not as pronounced as in a single male polygynous or a solitary group. And so that's why chimps, male, uh, female male chimps are different, uh, because male chimps have a lot more muscle mass, okay? Okay, so monogamous social groups is low male-to-male -male competition, so sexual dimorphism is low, and we can see that with ourselves, right? We have very relatively low sexual dimorphism compared to, like, um, gorillas. Um, but here we see, like we were talking about, sexual dimorphism is high between the two. And here we have the multiple male polygynous groups, and we can see that with these um, gelatas here. And you can see that the male is much bigger, but not quite as big as this gorilla compared to, uh, male gorilla compared to the female gorilla, or this um, male orangutan compared to a female orangutan. Okay, so that's it relatively short and over the next couple weeks I'll be doing one lab a week because we have um, I'm not going to do a review session uh, but I will give you resources to review on your own time um, so do all the exercises in the lab today and use the appendices for it and so do next Friday at 11:59 p.m. is lab 12 so do tomorrow at 11:59 p.m. will be labs 10 and 11 so once again um, look into your canvas and uh, I will have the exercises uploaded there and I'll also have um, the PowerPoints uploaded. Uh, hope you are having a good weekend or week and hope you have a great weekend and stay safe and I'll see you same time same place next uh, Thursday.